So do you know other people of your generation that are returning to the continent? But in terms of people in my position, like I don't have many close friends who have done it, but I know a lot of us that have intentions too, for sure. Because so many people are just, are just tired of living in the rat race. And look, we're only like, I'm talking about people who are like 24, 25, like around my age group, and they're tired already and they've been what, working professionally for what? Four years. Yeah. <laughs> Like, and already, uh, you know, like, yeah. us Gen Z's are all about the soft life. <laughs> Welcome to Blacks and to Africa. I am so happy to have my girl with me, Gen Z. She just told me she's Gen Z. <laughs> I am. Uh -huh. Did I say that right? You did. Ah! Oh my god. Y'all hear that accent? Yes. From she's London. straight from London town. Hey, <laughs> big up London. <laughs> West side, you gotta give us a side. Northwest. So how how did we meet? We met like before COVID mm -hmm. at Yege Yege, which is East Africa's biggest um, music festival. And do you remember exactly yeah. how we how we? Clicked? I remember. I remember we were all standing by like the food stalls. Okay. At near, do you remember it? Like up on the hill, there was like a food area that we were standing in. Okay. And um, I saw like a bunch. I think I heard like a bunch of American accents. Okay. And like you're all together. I'm like, oh my god, you guys are you from America? <laughs> <laughs> and then we got talking, and then the other girls are out here doing like a peace corps thing. Yeah. And like you had linked up with them either in Kampala. Yeah. Yeah, and then like, yeah, that's how I remember you. You have a really good memory. Mm -hmm. I just remember like your conversation was so deep and it was all of this chaos and it was loud music, but you had this really deep conversation. I was just like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were talking about women's rights and you were talking about body positivity, et cetera, and we stayed in touch. That's so true, yeah. And then you came, you came to, I moved to Nairobi. And then you came to Nairobi to visit, like, just a couple of months ago, right? Yeah, literally just a couple of months ago. And unlike so many people who really do waste my time, and they hit me up in my DMs, and they're just like, oh, I like how you live your life, and I want to meet you, and I'm coming to Nairobi, let's link up, and we never end up linking up, and I share all of these resources. You and I actually had dinner together. It was nice meeting you met my friends. friends. Yeah. yeah. I, I had already told so many people about Todre. I was like, I have an older friend. <laughs> I had like shown people her pictures. Like, look at her. Just, can you believe she's 47? Can you believe? I'm like, what? But yeah, so I liked, I liked, I liked having intergenerational friendships as well. Because I feel like you you um, you're not scared of like different age groups you're not scared of like growing old when i like meet people like you living their life you're not old at all um but when i meet people like you living your life how you're living it i'm like i can't wait to be that age mm -hmm. i met an 80 year old the other day who was who knew so much about like theater and drama what i'm into and i was like wait i can't wait to be 83 and like still going to shows and being strong so like i think it's nice to like have a mix of friends it's so nice. Yeah. And then, like, you, you just reach a point where you're like, okay, I'm resting in my wisdom. I'm an elder now. You know, I have younger friends, and I cut up with my younger friends. But at the same time, like, when I need to step in as the big sister or the auntie and just drop mm -hmm. some wisdom, I do that. Yeah. And even when I was telling Todre about this guy I was seeing, she was the only person that came, like, correct in her response. I was like, okay, the age came through there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, true. Yeah. And then now you're here again. This is yeah. your second time coming back since I've been in Nairobi. Yeah. And you are staying at the Wonder House and you you've been facilitating these <sighs> workshops. Yeah. Yeah. And I attended one of the workshops and then we've been hanging out. We went to go see a film, an indie film. So tell us about why you're here at this time and what you're doing. Sure. <clears throat> so actually, funnily enough, I was I just love Nairobi, right? It's my fourth time here. Um, I can't even believe that. Oh my god, it's actually wow. my fourth time. Yeah. So um, the first time I came when I was eighteen with my friend. She's Indian Kenyan, and like I came and visited her. I had a great experience, but it was a very Indian Kenyan experience, right? Naturally, because that's her community and her family. Mm -hmm. 
And then the second time I came, I came with my university like bestie who is actually from Nairobi, grew up, born, raised here. Third time I was like, I need to bring my girls to see this city because it's so nice. That's when we ended up seeing you. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth time I was like, no, I want to like be here for a chunk of time because I'd only be coming for like weeks here and there. I want to be here for a chunk of time and really experience like the city because it's somewhere I could actually see myself living in like strong 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 mm. yeah yeah like 100 percent. like i i want to like live duly between here and london um uh but i was meant to stay with the university friend but she couldn't end up coming and i was like what am i going to do like i really want to come but like i can't i can't afford to be out here for a month just like you know actually i'm gonna stay with her and her family right. um and then i was just like wait i have projects that i want to do like artistic projects I want to make a short film, I want to make like a video artifact because um, I'm currently studying acting, I'm doing a master's in acting in, at a drama school in London and we have like indep independent projects we're currently carrying out. So I thought it would be so nice to be in a space that would facilitate the work that I want to do here, yeah. especially the type of work that I want to do that includes people like um, because as Todre, you came to a body conversation circle. So mm -hmm. talking about our bodies, how it impacts the way that we walk through our lives. Um, and then I was like, I literally came across this page so randomly on Instagram, like, and it just looked beautiful. It was just this house and people like wonder and express ideas and it's a place to be vulnerable. So then I was just like, hmm, I wonder if they have like, a residency program mm -hmm. and then I was like it was literally 2 a.m. I just got back from a night out in London <laughs> I looked on the website and I clicked on the tab and I saw residency and I was like whoa that's it so I applied that morning 2 a.m. from 2 to 3 a.m. I was like this on my laptop just like pouring my heart out as to why I felt like I should be the person to be a resident at their place and why I think our values aligned and here I am. Oh my gosh, it yeah. was not random. That was divine. That was divine. That was divine guidance. Divine. And I'm glad you listen. I don't be listening sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you you fill out the application. How long was it before they accepted you? I want to say like within the next few hours. Are you serious? Like, yeah. Um, Toya, who's the one of the founders, she messaged me, she emailed me, and she was like, I can feel your energy like from this email mm. like let's schedule a call oh my but gosh. i kind of knew from there. <laughs> like yeah. technically i hadn't been accepted but i just i felt that we were yeah. already in alignment yeah and i said to my friends because i'm a student at the moment i'm not making money um so when i was going they're like how are you going to nairobi for a month without any income without anything i was like mm, you guys don't have to worry <laughs> don't have to worry. i have faith like i know things will work out yes. as soon as you just it's just, it's if you want it to work out, it definitely works out. You just have to like believe it'll work out. And it did. Like even the ticket I used to get here, it was the last seat for that flight. If I didn't get that flight, then I probably wouldn't be here. Like it was literally like 400 pounds. Is that how cheap it is to fly from London? No. Okay. No, but I, it, I, I mean, I flew through Saudi Arabia. On the way back, I have a 12 hour layover. So it wasn't the best flight, but I knew I wanted to be here and I had a purpose here. Yeah. So I made it work. I love that. <laughs> okay, so let's let's go into your backstory. Sure. You are first generation Brit, and both your parents are Nigerian. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Which tribe for people that that matters? Okay, we're well, going <laughs> a tribe. Um, tribe called Urubu. So it's an ethnic minority tribe in the south south of Nigeria, specifically in Delta State. Okay, both parents. Both parents. In fact, like almost from the same village. They're really closely related. Did they know each other in the village? Or no, no, they didn't grow up in the village. Oh, they grew up in the village. <laughs> no, no, no. They grew up in Lagos. The cities. So my okay. mom grew up in Wari. My okay. dad grew up in Lagos and a bit in London. Okay. And then my mom went to university in the States. Okay. And then my dad, like eventually came to London and worked, yeah. Okay, so when did your parents move to the UK? In 1993, they both moved. My dad was there earlier. I'm not actually sure the date he moved. Okay. But my mom came to join him in 1993. Mm. And then had my brother 
1993. Okay. Yeah. And then you came along. In 1997. In 97. <laughs> 97. Okay, so yeah. talk to me about your experience growing up in London as a black girl. I had very positive experiences early, like early growing up, like around like zero to like five, six. They were really positive. I went to this small Catholic school in Burnt Hope called the Annunciation. That was a state school. It was very mixed. People from all different ethnicities, black people, white people. It was it was actually a very nice environment. Like I can't complain. Um, and then I ended up after that at seven years old going to a prep school called Olden and Prep. And um, that's where things changed. Like it was a very obviously beautiful school, like beautiful grounds, great education, all those things. Um, but I think that's the first time I noticed that I was black. Because I don't think, I don't think I'd really noticed before when you're in such a diverse environment, like, you know that you're black. Maybe you don't know that you're black if it's never been like a thing. So, it, but then it became a thing because I was one of few. And I remember for the first time ever, just feeling like a bit out of place especially because these were like really rich white kids as well. It wasn't just like, you know, regular schmegular, like um, like working class people like I had come from. And I remember literally going home to my nanny, like at age seven. I had never like had any perception of like my body or like, you know, because you're a kid, you're just, so, you're just so free. You don't think of these things. And I remember asking Gift, who was my nanny at the time, I was like, Gift, am I fat? And then she was like, no, you're not fat. <laughs> what do you mean you're fat? Are you just popping fat? <laughs> but I was like, okay, maybe being fat is a bad thing. <laughs> Where was Gift from? She was Nigerian. Okay. Yeah, okay. she was Nigerian. Then. I'm like, ah, you're not fat. Don't say that. You're not fat. <laughs> and, um, and so I think that's when I just started like realizing, I was like, oh my God, maybe like, because maybe the kids in the other school were just like all different types of body shapes, different, you know, you know, us. Us, we, our genetics are all different, like, so, like, kids are a bit chubbier, chunkier, but I was just, like, with skinny white girls and, like, skinny white boys, um, so, yeah, but, I mean, it was really fun, like, I still experience, like, what I'm doing now for the first time, which is acting, like, that's where, like, my passion was really picked up on, and I don't know whether it would be picked up on in the other school like this was a school of like the class was like what 15 people 15 20 kids like mm -hmm. the other class was like 30 kids like you know a lot more attention was paid to me to maybe even <clears throat> draw out that talent and develop it and my agents now literally she was my drama um teacher from when i joined that school at seven years mm -hmm. old so it's like that school did provide a lot for me um but it was hard um, and I always feel bad saying it was hard because like always my parents worked so hard so that I could attend the school but like the reality was like as much as it gave me opportunities like it was hard being like a minority in a school like that. Okay. Yeah. So but you never had anybody call you out of your name? You never experienced discrimination from your teachers or anything like um, that? I would say that it wasn't overt but it was definitely subtle. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I mean, no, like it was definitely overt with like children. I remember like, even if it wasn't happening directly to me, because I am black, I'm gonna experience that as well. Um, I remember like people would say things like, oh, were you part of, were you a, what, like, were you a slave? Like, <laughs> like, you know, kids just saying like most ridiculous <laughs> things, like were you a slave? Like, um, <laughs> like, I remember like, as an insult though, they were saying it to like, or they would, the N-word was used freely, yeah, like mm. in songs and... Okay. Yeah, so there was context to it, um, but still. And then there was just a general favour towards people that were more aligned with, like, Eurocentrism. But it doesn't seem like it really affected you or scarred you or held you back in any way. Um, no, but that's probably due to... I want to say it affected my confidence. Yeah. I do want to say that. I think who you're seeing now isn't the same person. Like, I was really shy, like, growing up. Mm -hmm. Like, I had, like, an internal confidence, but, like, outwardly, I was, like, shy. Um, I, wasn't as, I wasn't as confident as I am now. 
Okay. Yeah, but I've like I when I was like sixteen, I started like reading loads of like African literature and learning a lot of the things that I had thought about like beauty standards, about like the world, like you know, just really like relearning, unlearning and relearning about the world. And I, I realized that like all of the truths that I was told, like even like Black History Month was just slavery month in school. Wow. So it was like we would learn about the American slave trade. That's it in in the UK. Yeah, That's we would watch crazy. Roots <laughs> because yeah. the UK has a very long and extensive history of African involvement. Yeah, it's complicated. It's yeah. yeah. We never learned any of it. In fact, <laughs> when we did learn about like colonial remnants, it was in a positive light, like the Commonwealth, like the Queen, like you know, the monarchy was very much pushed as. A positive benevolent, yeah, benevolent, like Great Britain, not Britain, Great Britain, and what made Britain great? Stealing like all the resources from the world, right? Mm. So I ask about your experience growing up in London as a person of African descent, because in a little bit of research that I've done, we think shit's really bad in the states. But comparatively speaking, as far as incarceration rates, as far as graduation rates, rates, it's worse, it's worse in the UK for Black people. And it can get a little tricky in comparing stats because the UK doesn't really break things down by race, mm. you know, but even still you can sort of glean like, oh, yeah. this, is, this is pretty bad. But those experiences, those extreme experiences, that's not, that wasn't your experience. No, but cause that's because I have a class privilege. Do you know what I mean? So I was shielded from a lot of that like stuff. Like in terms of like, I never used public transport to school. Like a lot of stop and searches happen. Like with kids walking across, like I got dropped by my mom every day. Do you know what I mean? So I was protected. A lot of that was like a class thing rather than like me being just naturally exempt from it. What class would you say you grew up as? I said definitely not middle class. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But comfortable. Comfortable. Yeah. I know yeah. I went to private. I was privately educated. Like that's not that common. I want to talk about why Kenya, because you have dual citizenship. Yeah. You have a passport for Great Britain, right? Mm -hmm. You have a passport for Nigeria. Yeah. And so. In thinking of you know this exodus of Gen Z's returning to Africa, I would think you would just go back to yeah. your home country or your parents' home country. Yeah, 100%. why not Nigeria? So why not Nigeria? I do love Nigeria. Um, it's such it has such a great spirit to it. Like it's very Lagos. I can't speak for the whole of Nigeria, but I'll talk about my experience in Lagos which is like fun, like definitely like party central, you'll have a good time. Um, it's also very chaotic, like in a way that Nairobi isn't. Even though I speak to like Nairobi locals here, they're like, this place is chaotic, it's mad. I'm like, you haven't been to Lagos, this is why you can say this. Like, it's just a very hectic place to live in. Infrastructurally, it's not as, like, it's not as um, superior to Nairobi and for like someone like me who's like right now like solo traveling like I can just easily come to the airport here book an uber and be on my way and it's not as smooth right now in Lagos like you have people like heckling you as you come out of the airport people are trying to take your bags to, like... heckling <laughs> yeah. yeah like taxi come come I have taxi, oh. taxi, 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 taxi. <laughs> but like in a much more like they're not being aggressive, but it comes across in a much more aggressive way than, for example, when like a Kenyan dude, like taxi man, is like outside of like <laughs> Kenyatta being like, uh, Madam, taxi. <laughs> and then, like, come, 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 I have taxi, taxi for you, come, come, come. <laughs> and you're just like, please, like even just, <laughs> even just going through the airport, like, you know, it's just so hectic. Like, it's just, we just have a lot to work on. And so it doesn't make it easy to just like travel. Like I say, if you want to come to, like you need to know people 
I don't have to know anyone here to come here. Like, because this economy has also been built in a way that it facilitates tourism, in a way that like, we don't have a tourism industry in, in Nigeria like this. It's, it's, it's very incomparable. You know, if, if someone tries to argue that we do, okay, fair, but it's nothing like this. And I, I just don't think we do. That's not where our money comes from. But other Africans seem to like it because all my African friends are like, oh, you love it. it the shopping's a, amazing. There's the a spirit culture. to yeah. it. Like, Nigerians are so... And do you know what it is? I actually, in terms of an African experience, like, I prefer Nigeria in terms of that. Like, mm. and even I wanted to visit Accra because I'm like, maybe that's somewhere I could do a dual, like, living a few months there. Because I still like the... West African-ness, mm -hmm. like the heat, like here is cold. Like we in sweaters, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Really clothed. Um, and I just, I like, I don't, I don't necessarily care for high rise buildings and good roads. It's not necessarily why I'm in Nairobi, but I'm just, in terms of that was my first point of like infrastructure, it's just easier for me to fly here and like maneuver my way through the city. Um, in terms of um, the spirit of the people here, I really like that. Like, very chill, calm, polite. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, they can be very passive aggressive too. Like, I'm not going to paint like Kenyans to just be these like eat, pray, love people. Like, people are multifaceted, right? So, I've met mean people as well. Um, but generally, I do like the like calmness of the city in comparison to like the loudness of um, Lagos, which I appreciate too. Um, another thing was that I had just come across really interesting people like Padre. Yeah, like I just. So many other people, right? So many yeah. other people, and there's just so much to to do. And I'm sure those spaces exist in there. In fact, I know that they do. I guess you just hang out in your bubble of friends when you're from somewhere, but coming here, it forced me to really go out and experience and be adventurous in a way that I'm not usually. And I like the, no, I am usually, because that's why I'm here, obviously. Um, and I also like the different landscapes. So for example, just got back from Diani, been to Lamu. Like you can just fly an hour and you're on like a completely different terrain. Exactly. Like, and like a completely different culture. Like Swahili culture is so different from like here. Um, and it's just like a one hour trip and like, you, and then you can go to the mountains and like Lake Naivasha and I just love, I just love the diversity of experiences you can have in one country. Yeah, yeah. I mean in the city you can go on safari, like there's so many things you, <laughs> that you can do in Nairobi. Yeah. Well, but you are actually considering purchasing a condo here. Yeah. So that's like for real, for real investment of your time. Yeah. And I just wonder with you as an actor, how will you navigate that? Do you think you can practice your craft here? Um, I don't see my, I'm open. I'll never say never. Like, of course, if a film opportunity came up in Nairobi or like a series, I would jump at it. Um, but how I've actually pictured it, because acting is so project intensive, it's very project based, like you do, you shoot something or you have a theatre run for six months or three months or whatever the run is, and then like you have a break and then you have a next project. Mm -hmm. I really like that style of living because it means that I know that when I'm working it's for a limited period of time and then I can go and like do something else. And in that something else-ness, I thought, oh yeah, I can be in Nairobi, like having a business in between. Mm. So that's why I thought of like, you know, having a condo here. Um, and also like the value being a foreign purchaser that you get for your money yeah. is just insane. Yeah. Like you could get like a studio apartment for $40,000. I've seen mm. them in Kilimani. Oh, <laughs> that's right, because you wanted me to go with you to look at flats. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 40000 is not bad. Yeah. For a studio? For a studio. Okay, I thought so. you were, you know what, I thought you would say less. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I've never, I've never really researched the buying market here, so I don't yeah. know. I mean, you can get 
it's, you can get also way cheaper. It depends the standard that you want to live in. Exactly. Like, yeah, like you can get way, way cheaper. So do you know other people of your generation that are returning to the continent? So I watch a lot of other African YouTubers um, and I do see that people are doing it. I don't know if people personally, I have a lot of friends who grew up in like Lagos, for example, and only came to university in, in England. So naturally they've gone back home. But in terms of people in my position, like I don't have many close friends who have done it, but I know a lot of us that have intentions too, for sure. Because so many people are just, are just tired of living in the rat race. And look, we're only like, I'm talking about people who are like 24, 25, like around my age group, and they're tired already. And they've been what, working professionally for what? Four years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and already, like, uh, you know, I'm like yeah. us Gen Zs are all about the soft life. <laughs> like no one wants to like labor, work. Nobody wants to struggle. Nobody wants to struggle. That's what I love about y'all because y'all are just real clear on what you will and won't do. You know, and like I'm working. Yeah. I would be like my manager would be like, "This needs to be done by this." I'll be like, "Okay, um, I won't be able to get it to you then." Based on my timeline and my capacity, I'll be able to get it to you by the end of next week. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I just can't imagine my parents' generation doing it literally, or like, or even like a Gen X or a millennial, like, you know, like, but Gen Zs are just so like, I remember like, I was, I literally recently left a job and there was a woman in one of my teams who was just doing too much. And she was even the reason I was like, I don't need to be here. Like, <laughs> Like, why are you trying to get me to work that much harder? Like, I don't get it. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, no. But I learned a lot from you guys because when I'm with younger people, it's a reminder of who I was. It's like unadulterated, un, uh, unbeaten, <laughs> unbeaten Tadre. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, you know, that is wrong. And I should advocate for myself. And you know what? This is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. A lot of it is just showing face as well and pretending like you're doing more than you're actually doing. So I'm like, why do that? <laughs> like, realistically, we could all have four hour work days because I know that we're not all here like this all throughout the day. Like, people are having a coffee break, people are talking to their colleagues. And for many people, they're spending two hours of the day smoking cigarettes outside. Right, surfing the internet. <laughs> Literally. You know? So do you, is that the reason why you are considering or you are moving to Africa from, because it's really interesting to me because coming from the US perspective, we tend to idolize Europe. When we go on vacation, the first place we go is Europe. You know, and we'll keep going back. And especially like for black people, I'm like, at, at what point do you not want to visit where we are originally from? And not but, only that, if I interrupt you, mm -hmm. at what point do you not want to put money into an economy who tell you when you're on holiday that you're lesser than, when you experience literal racism? Like why, like I just, I don't enjoy, like I will travel Europe, but it has to be very like contextual based as to why I'm going because I do not like the idea that I'm going on holiday, I'm meant to be relaxing, but then I'm experiencing racism. And the racism in Europe is very different from the racism in London. Even the racism outside of London is very different. To, outside of London is very different from the racism in London. Like, so I feel like in a sense, I'm even shielded in London. In Europe, you're being called the N-word on the streets. Girl. I can't deal with that. <clears throat> How can I be paying money to go to a country and call the N-word? No. It, especially if you look African. Like, I have friends who very much look African-American, if that's even such a thing. But okay. they have, like, straight hair, little right. pixie cuts. And, you know, it's obvious that, you know, I guess it's obvious to some people that they're not African. Mm. When I traveled to Paris years ago, I was still married then with a Nigerian friend specifically to go shopping. We just had it like that and we just wanted to go shopping because yeah. you heard you hear all this about Paris and that. She was treated so 
bad. Like this woman elbowed her in the ribs on the, on the train because she like sat on her coat. You know how you just yeah. accidentally sit on somebody's coat. Yeah. And I, you know, I had these little uh, twists in my hair and they thought I was African and they treated me as such. Mm. I was treated so poorly that I actually started crying. Oh I went to like I get you don't call it the tube in Paris, but like there's subway. Yeah. And I was asking the guy in the booth, like, how do I get from here to there? And he was just like, I don't speak English. You need to speak French. Da, da, da. And he was so nasty about it. And I had experienced so many microaggressions since I had been there to just to spend money. I was just spending money, you know? Yeah. And I just was like, well, you understand this, don't you? <laughs> And I walked away and then I was like looking at my little map and then I just felt a teardrop and this guy comes over and he's like, I'm so sorry about what you experienced. Where are you trying to go? Let me help you. But then he was also trying to holler and I was like, oh, you know, Can I it was too much. Yeah. And at the, my, my um, feeling about Paris was like, fuck these people and this country. Mm. And I never wanted to go back. But I've talked to other people who have had amazing experiences. And I've talked to some people who are like myself, who are, we phenotypically, I guess we look more what someone would think is African. Mm -hmm. And they've had horrible experiences. Yeah, thank you for sharing that experience. It's, it's reminding me of like, because um, we used to go to Paris a lot as children because of Disneyland. And oh, like, we would go. Yeah, that's okay. Disneyland in Paris. <laughs> You're so American centric. I am, so I am. US centric. You know, that's a Disneyland in Japan too. Did you know that? No. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, yeah, but like I just remember this image came to my head of my aunt like having a fight on the tube in different languages with with like a Parisian and they were like not physically but like verbally, like yeah. yeah. Um but you know what? I went to Paris in twenty nineteen after having no interest but that's why I say I go to European countries very like in a very specific context because we went to Afropunk mm. in Paris mm -hmm. and we met the coolest people of colour, like black Parisians, and that was one of my best trips in 2019. Mm -hmm. Like it was great. Like we went to this black owned vegan restaurant in the city, yeah. like the whole experience was just so enriching because I, I am interested in meeting like other diaspora people and sometimes yeah. you need to go to their countries yeah. so it's about being intentional about how you navigate through those cities like you can yes. come to London and have the best like black British experience yeah 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 but having going there and knowing someone is so important because yeah. I actually I did a workshop like a leather fashion and leather workshop at the London College of Fashion mm. so I was there I don't know for a few weeks and I was like Brixton. <laughs> That's all I knew. I was like, Brixton. And I got to Brixton and I just kind of walked around. I was like, oh. I don't know. I think I was expecting Rastas to just come out and greet me. <laughs> and, greet me and take me by the hand, doctor, and leave me. <laughs> Empress. <laughs> That's what you were expecting. <laughs> Queen. <laughs> take me to a Caribbean restaurant. Oh my God. <laughs> that didn't happen, did it? <laughs> That's so funny. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> I'm just really bad. I'm telling you. My no, no, no. I get it. No, I had a friend from Birmingham, which is still in England. They came to Brixton and they were like, wow, is this what Africa is like? There are so many black people. And bear in mind, Brixton is actually very gentrified. It's giving not that black anymore. It's still obviously quite black, but not in any way that it used to be. So I was like, that's so interesting. Maybe yeah. coming from Birmingham, I don't know. I, I, that's what, you know, I can't even remember when I went. Maybe it was like mid 2000s, early, I don't know. But I was like, where do black people? <laughs> no, and coming from Washington, DC, I was like, I was ready, you know? <laughs> You have to go to Peckham, maybe, Peckham. Yeah. And then do what? And just roll up on people. <laughs> hey! You know? Yeah, it's true. Like, it's so true. Yeah, like, what do you do? So, but you, you know, you you are from the promised land. There's so many people that are trying to get to where you were born and raised. Yeah. 
And so there has to be more than just, I'm tired of the rat race that propels you to leave most of what you know and come here. Yeah, because I want like more for myself. As like, in? I want, I don't want to have to, um, I think when you're navigating in an environment where there is structural racism, that's always a barrier. And don't get me wrong, people push through those barriers and there are the, there are the exceptions. But like, do I want to fight so hard just to like live my dreams or to have like, and the thing is, like I'm obviously trying to be an actor in London, which is like quite a difficult thing to do as a, as an artist in general, as an actor in general, whether you're white, black, Asian, um, but then being like a black actor, a black woman who's trying to be an actor, that's even like another, but somehow I'm still called to do that because that's what's on my heart and that's like my passion and that's my dream. Um, whereas like in terms of like entrepreneurship and like business and like those other aspects that I'm interested in, I'm not going to, I don't want to have to push through those barriers when I don't have to. And like why, I just don't see why I want to fight. I just don't, that, that idea of like hustle, hustle mentality isn't really, how I'm naturally aligned anyway. Like, I just think I'm quite a relaxed person. <laughs> wholesome. <laughs> oh my God, I told, told you I was wholesome yesterday. She was like, nah, you're a grown woman. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? It turns out it means something completely different in the American context. Yes. <laughs> like house on the prairie. <laughs> yeah, I know, like wholesome just went holistic, like great. Um, and so those are one of the reasons I also really love being around a society that reflects me. Am I allowed to say yes. that? Yes. It's just nice yes. to like not be the minority. Like I like, we are literally global majority in the world. We and, are. And like, so I, I, I hate even saying like minority because we actually are the global majority, but it's nice to be in an environment where that is like reflected. Yeah. Like, I feel the difference when I'm here, just in terms of even just my self-esteem. Like, I wouldn't say I'm someone who has low self-esteem in the UK, but here there's a difference. So maybe I, maybe it's just so, these things are so insidious and they're so subtle and they just creep in. They just, they, it's just so, they're so delicate. You know, they're not talk in Talk your place. shit. I love when you talk your shit. Like, <laughs> no, it's, it's so true. It's, it's more of, of what you feel. Mm. It's a vibration of the place and it's a vibration of people. You. you know, we we do these exercises, you know, where we, um, I don't know if it's like a certain workshop and they want to show you the power of energy and they'll have someone stand at the front of the room and they'll have that person like stretch their arms out mm. and like try not to move them, right? And then they'll tell everybody else in the room, focus all your love and good intentions on that person. And then the facilitator will come up and they'll grab that person's wrist and they'll try to move it, they can't. Mm -hmm. Then the facilitator will say, okay, just think negative thoughts about that person, focus bad intentions on that person. The facilitator comes up, grab, grabs the arm and they're immediately able to push it down. And so that shows you the power of energy. Yeah. And so when you're a person who's not white and you walk into any space, what you're typically getting is that negative energy from people. Mm -hmm. At the very best, it's a curiosity. Why is she here? Mm. Who does she know? Yeah. Right? And then for me, you know, in workspaces and academic spaces, it's like, I don't want to work with this person. I don't want to teach this person. And like you said, there's this, there's exceptionalism. We push through that yeah. and we succeed and we do really well. However, are we ever able to self-actualize? I think everything that Word. you're saying Word. talk is is it, it leads to self actualization. Yeah. And I think about like the black celebrities that everybody knows, like P. Diddy, name somebody yeah. else, Beyonce, Beyonce, Beyonce. Yeah. and we're like, okay, we know those people. They seem successful, 
but imagine who they would be mm. in this context. So true. And even now we see them leaning and pulling from Africa and elevating in the arts based on that um the African influence. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. But I love that because it's like your generation my generation and i would even argue before mm -hmm. because black folks have been coming back to africa since the dawn of time for a long yeah, yeah since we were able to yeah. but the thing is is like can you picture it mm. if you can't visualize it yeah. then it are won't you happen. saying oh for people that like people that don't have a vision to come back right yeah yeah and a lot of people don't and i think I hate to say it, but I think they're just so deep in like, how could you not want to, like, for me, it's just like, I don't, I can't rationalize. Okay, fair enough. You know, these European places are your home or the diaspora, you've grown up, that's what you know. Um, but when you know that you deserve better, I know that I deserve better than that. I know that I deserve better, that I can walk into the streets here and people are greeting me, Mambo, like that, how collective the society is, how communal the collect the, the society, the societies are over here. That individualism, like if you smile at someone on the tube, and I, including myself, we'll look at you like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? Oh, they weird. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that so sad? Like you know, people barely speak to their neighbours. Like you know, like especially if you're living in a city. Like I don't know about the countryside. Like. City life is very much just like, I'm here on my own. Like if you have children, it's, you have to find childcare. Like you can't just drop them off at your neighbors. Like it's so individual. And I don't necessarily want to live like that either. I want to live in a collective communal way. And I know that the way that I can have that is being in a society that values that. You can't, like it's hard to have, like my friend literally has a baby. He's, I can't even say he's a baby, he's like, what, three years old now? How many times have I seen that child and we live in the same city? But like work is like kicking like my ass. After a day of work, I'm sorry, I'm not traveling an hour on the tube. Like I'm just so, I have, I have all the best intentions to see that child, but I'm drained, I'm tired. So after all, if I'm not the parent, I'm not gonna be the one sacrificing my life to see the, do you know what I mean? Like, and it's sad and I'd love, but if I was in a society that facilitated that, then it would be easier for me to see that child. Like, it's just facts. Like, my mum used to see her nieces and nephews all the time when she was in Nigeria. Like, she would take care of them all the time because she was in, she was in a society that valued that. A society that also supported that. And that was the first thing that I, one of the first things I noticed when I moved to Kampala, Uganda was that there was actually time to have a social life. I moved to East Africa from Los Angeles and you know, LA, most people move there for a dream, you know, a very specific dream. Me and my girls, we all had a dream. Me and my girls, we all had our nine to five and we all had our dream, whether it was like producing um, movies, whether it was singing, et cetera. And it was like getting the G8 together in terms of us trying to like do brunch. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, we, we schedule it months out. And then on top of that, you know, you have, you know, some people in our clique that had families, that had a husband, that had children. And so in Kampala, I was like, oh, you have these middle class, you have these upper class people who have very full lives, mm -hmm. their social life is is not impeded it, on. Yeah, their yeah. social life really is their life, and work is kind of just an aspect of their life. <laughs> so to be yeah. to be real, yeah. like I have my friends that work in Nigerian companies in Nigeria. The, the foreign, the international companies are a bit different, like in in the in those countries of residence. But the night, like going to work is banter. Do you know what banter is? What's banter? It's like fun, it's like jokes. Yeah! Like your, your friends with all your colleagues, like, oh my and I'm like, God. is this what white people are experiencing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they're experiencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But going to work is like this fun thing, you meet up with your friends, you like talk about things, like you get your work done, and like five are sharp that they've all gone. They're heading for drinks, or they're going for dinner. 
or they're hanging out. Like, they have full social lives. They really, really do. And I was so shocked. Like, I, my, my, when my homegirls is Uganda, and she used to live upstairs, and the way she would talk about hanging out with her colleagues, I was just like, <laughs> that's my cousin. Why that's would you cousin, do yeah. that? Because in the U.S., like making people hang out with their colleagues is, is like a punishment. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, I got to spend eight hours with these people. Yeah. Now we got this special after work yeah. shit we got to yeah. do. Yeah. But if you want to move ahead in the company, that's what you have to, to do. It's, about network. It's, all, it's nothing is genuine. That's the worst part. Like, it's especially, especially if you have to code switch. Especially if you can't bring your full self to work. Especially, you know what I mean? Especially if they're like already have these perceptions of you that you need to like battle off. It's too much. Especially it's if you can't much. even wear your natural hair. You know, <laughs> like you can't like, even. You can't even be you at all. Like, just yeah. the things that we do, the things that we've done to survive as people of color in a space that was not created for us. It's extensive. The list is extensive. I didn't think we deep it. Like, it's when you start listing all the ways. Like, I had a friend that never wanted to change her hair because she just didn't want, like, the the questions. And, like, oh, what did you do to your hair? Oh, your hair's grown so long. And that, and, like, oh, and you know what happened. She got extensions in. Like, it's not rocket science. Like, white women get extensions too. Like, white women change their hairstyles, like, you know, like, it's just too much. It's a lot. It's too much. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, I just think being, I just feel a certain, like you said, regardless of all the reasons I can give, I just feel in my spirit and ease here. And I want to honor that and respect that. I love that. I love that you value yourself and you see the worth and... You, you've had these life experiences with going to Nigeria, I would assume would yeah. be like your first introduction into life outside of London, right? Yeah, yeah. Where you actually can see the ease. You can actually visualize another life. I want to go back to what you said about seeing yourself reflected in other people. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the late 80s. In the late 80s, I was a teenager. And that song, like, Baby Got Back was out. Mm -hmm. And that song is really indication of how black women were shamed. This is before white women was getting BBLs. You know, we were made to feel ashamed of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I come here to East Africa and I see my body type everywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I'm... I'm petite, but I'm curvy, yeah. and my hips are low, and it's like, I kind of felt like, well, maybe my hips should sit up, because that's how they sit typically on some European women. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah. there I go, there I go, there Literally, I go, you know so what I mean? Nice. Yeah, it's so nice to be appreciated as well, like, just even for myself, like, being here, or like, when I'm in, like, black countries, yeah, I've been to Nairobi, been to Nigeria obviously several times because yeah, that's where I'm from, Uganda. And it's so nice to just have people like appreciate your beauty mm. and not even like in a like hyper sexualized, fetishy way. Like, wow, you're beautiful. Brembo. Yeah, that's what they say. Ume pendeza. Hey. Yes. 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 Penda. <laughs> when you walk down the street, you yeah. know, like and, and just the average person will just and not, you. not even just men, Pretty. like yeah. women, mm -hmm. oh, you're so gorgeous. Like, you know what I mean? It's like both, it's just like an appreciation of like us. And one thing, oh, another thing I really love about um, Kenyan women or like women, I don't want to speak about Kenyan women, but I can speak about the women that I've had experiences with in Nairobi is that, or that I've seen, is that natural hairstyles are so big here. Like locks braids even just having like natural low cut like afros which i really like like that's not the same in lagos by the way i think we've had this discussion mm. like it's a lot more like of a eurocentric standard of beauty um in the circles that i'm in anyway than like i have i do not see wigs and weaves here like i'll go out I, I i literally was this was intentional yesterday i was um at the screening and i looked around and i was like let me try find a wig or a weave there wasn't one in the whole cinema. No. Not one. 
and again like i think that's so affirming for me having grown up in a society that privileges like whiteness it's so nice to be in a space where like i don't feel pressure to do those things and to change myself because ultimately like if you keep on changing yourself like it's it's a form of self-hate like yeah and it's not to shame anyone for like it's not to shame anyone for assimilating because i understand like we have to do what we have to do but i don't want to have to assimilate like do you know what i mean like i just don't want to do things that take me further away from who i naturally am do you get yeah i totally get because yeah. in our socialization we are being shape-shifted to be palatable for society and when you come here, particularly, you know, as a middle class or upper class person, mm -hmm. there's less shape-shifting that you have to do. Yeah. So we talked about um, being otherized um, in our home countries due to race, etc. What has your experience been as a woman here in Kenya, in Kenya um, dating... Uh, dealing with the I, patriarchy. Knew, I knew we had to come here with Todrick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Because, I mean, my personal perspective and my spiritual teachings tell me that we are here to love. Mm. And, and then we, you know, we're born in these large metropolitan spaces with millions of people. And sometimes it's so difficult mm. to get at love. Mm. So talk to me about your experience navigating patriarchy in london navigating it here in nairobi oh, navigating the dating spaces in london navigating them here in nairobi sure i would say the misogynoir in london so misogyny plus racism together black women um it's just insane Shit. yeah like and it's not just even like from other races it's within your own I think because we've been so socialized again to privilege whiteness eurocentricity and power like ultimately like it's a power thing as well um and black women tend to be at the bottom of that hierarchy it can be really difficult like navigating just something as simple as like falling in love yeah, yeah. like it's sad like but that is a lot of like that is the experience of a lot of black women obviously i'm not saying it doesn't happen people i know people who are happily in love in london but the access to it and like the points that i just feel like the like everyone knows about like black british girl makeup right like if you're okay you don't okay maybe this is like a younger thing but okay, tell me yeah so like the american girls are always like black british girls like their makeup is like a one like they look so good okay but like, why is our makeup so good? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And often like, I'm not trying to be funny, but like often with makeup, like it's the more Eurocentric you look, like the better your makeup is. Like, the, like do you know what I mean? The more contoured your face is, oh, yeah. like the more straighter you can make your nose look, yeah. um, the more like structured you can make your face, the like more defined. Yeah. Um, and I think that black women in the UK have gotten so good at doing makeup. This is my theory, got so good at doing makeup because they've kind of had to, you know what I mean? Like, like just to like, just to, just to be like approached in a respectful way. Mm. Um, I just think the standard of beauty is a lot higher for, for black women. Mm. Um, and if you, if, if the aim is to look like a white woman, then of course we're gonna have to do so much more like if your aim is to look like a completely different race and i'm not saying that people's aim is to do that but it's insidious in the way that we even like use certain products like we highlight like with like three shades lighter our under eye like black british makeup is like notorious for that like our influence use like three four shades lighter on the under eye like that is not like that's not normal. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying. To, I'm like, I put some oil. Did I do it? I don't know. Like, <laughs> no, you're blending really well to your skin tone. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, and obviously I'm speaking to a specific generation of like the people I know. Like my parents' generation, I feel was a bit better. 
Are we sure? I don't know. I feel like the face was so much lighter than the neck. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's because makeup brands didn't stock their skin tones. That's that's yeah. part of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what? Let me just speak to the experiences I know. Um, I've, I, yeah, I can say that I've definitely like struggled um, to be, if I'm gonna be vulnerable on camera. Yeah, hundred percent. Like it's not. It's just not that easy. Did you open yourself up to dating non-black men? I did, but it's not as if like, the funny thing is, it's like black men are the ones who approach me. Like, it's not like, I'm, I don't think I'm classically the white man's type of black woman. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the white man's type of black woman is. I would think that you are. Me? No, they're like skinny, tall, like, you know, you know, you, Kodra, you know. Think of like white men with their black wives. They have a particular, even here in Nairobi, I see the white men they are a particular thin. type. They do be thin. They be thin. Yeah. They be thin and they be kind of like, like they'll be like dark skinned, thin. Okay, obviously if you're like light skinned, I'm sure they don't mind that too. But like they just have a particular okay. female type to them. Okay, got you. I got you. You know, like the Lupita Nyongas. They really, yeah, they do. Really they really want, want that like <laughs> experience. They want you to look good. And it's so funny gorgeous because, women, yeah. but like it's a particular type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I don't think I fit that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, but dating in Nairobi. Um, obviously, I haven't been here for too long, so I don't really like. But you've been back a <laughs> couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. Spill the tea, <laughs> child. <laughs> um, I dating in Nairobi is interesting. Okay, I will say that it is definitely. I don't feel like the barrier to love is as uh, as it is in the UK because first of all, we're all black. So if you're not gonna date like yourselves, and who are you gonna date? Um, Maybe try and know who. I've seen instances like colorism does exist here. Oh, you know absolutely. what I'm saying? Oh, and you, there yeah. are there is a contingent of people, male and female, mm -hmm. who are only interested in dating non-black people, but and that's they like find. A shiny thing. It's I a shmoney thing, but it's also proximity to whiteness and power, power and how you feel about yourself. And 100%, you know, 100%, yeah. yeah, no, no, I agree with that. And obviously, I think that we benefit as well for some like featureism. Like we don't necessarily have like broad, wide noses. We have quite straight noses, like our lips. Like you know what I mean. Like we do have like quite like um, like smaller features. Can I say? More aquiline features, yeah. Is that, is that what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you look so disappointed? Because <laughs> there's, you know, there's how people perceive you. Yeah. Right? But then there's also, like, who you are. Yeah. And what you project and how you see yourself, yeah. you know? Like, I've had uh, a couple of guys tell me, oh, you're getting lighter and lighter every time I see you. And it was, wow, it was meant to be a compliment. <laughs> And I'm just like, mm -hmm. I just need to be outside. I just need to get some sun because yeah. the color will yeah. come back, you know. But you, <laughs> but you are, you know, coming here in Nairobi, it's safe to say that dating for you has been easier, more e enjoyable. Yeah, just more, let me just put it this way, more accessible. Mm. Like it's just, it feels like it's something that I can do. In the UK, it's like, I, like I can date, like, but half the people I don't, sorry, 90% of the people, I don't even want to go on dates with them. Like, they're just not, to, they're not my taste. Ooh, I want to delve into that. Because you said that the men that approach you in London are black men. Mm -hmm. However, 90% of them is not your type of man. Yeah. Not your type. What type of guys typically approach you if you... <laughs> If you can generalize. Yeah, I think we have um, different, how do I frame this? Because I want to be accurate with my language. I would say the type of guys that approach me in the UK tend to not be serious. Mm. About maybe life. Mm, about life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant like relationships, but you meant life. They so they're not about life. Like that, their own life. Therefore, they, you know, they, you know, and I, I just think the things that maybe they're valuing on me, like I don't necessarily care about. Do you know what I mean? Like they might value you having like a big bum. 
Do you mean they look like approaching me correctly? Like, you know what I mean? Like, um, so yeah, I just don't think that it could work. They don't really have similar visions, like for life. Or we're not in a, we're not aligned, you know. And <laughs> like I have quite a big vision for my life. <laughs> Like, I would like, equally like to be someone who also has a big vision for their life. You're saying they just be out in the streets. They like just be in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> they just be in the streets. Like, I don't want someone in the streets. Like, I get you. Yeah. I totally get you. And even though we're different generations. You get it. I get you. Unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately. I, I get you. I, I would say that dating, and she spent time in the U.S. as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she spent time in the U.S. So she, you, you, your comparison of the different regions. I'm looking from a bird's eye view yeah, here. Yeah. So dating in the U.S. for me has been interesting. My best dating experiences were on the East Coast. So it's like New York area. Like New York, DC, okay. Philly, like mm. Baltimore, like my best experiences. Midwest is nice as well, but I, I didn't spend a lot of time there. Yeah. But I found the men in the Midwest to be more family oriented. Okay. And really valuing women. Oh, you know, wow. just sweet sweet men. Yeah. Um, but then the mindset. Because like you say, vision. I have a vision for my yeah. life. And it's not to stay here in this small city and live my life and then travel once I'm 65. Mm -mm. West Coast was horrible. I've had so many black women talk about dating or the black women from LA. They're like, it doesn't exist. It's horrible. So the, the type of men that would typically approach me, a black men that would typically approach me in LA, they were like, pro-black and i'm pro-black yes but that doesn't mean i hate other people they were hoteps they were like hoteps <laughs> and it was just like okay but we can love ourselves and not hate everybody else right right yeah yeah and then you know i thought everyone needs to go through that phase i went through that phase i went kind of went through that, that phase, phase in college where i was like yeah they devils for real <laughs> <laughs> but honestly everyone that knows me from uni thinks i'm an extremist <laughs> But not, not when a man is like 40, you know, 45, you know, I love my black sisters. I'm just like, okay. And they're often the most patriarchal ones. That's the worst part. And their love for black people doesn't come, it, it's not really from a good space. It's from a space of they locked me out and now I'm angry. Yeah. 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 It's not just like this pure space of like, I just love me. I'm I love me, me and I love us. Yeah, I love us. Yeah. Yeah, I love us. So yeah, I get that. But yeah, like, I'm not going to say, like, you know, dating isn't rough out in these streets in Nairobi either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, but I'm just saying, like, if I'm comparing it to where I'm coming from, then it has to be heaven. Not heaven. No, it has Because the bar is in hell in London. Ooh, I and just that, and, and, and Kevin Woman wouldn't agree with me, you see, so... Why wouldn't they agree with you? Because they think dating here is so rough. Mm. But then, Padre, you and I do have like international privilege as well. So maybe people are interested in us because like our accents are different, like that dual nationality, well, American nationality for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something to consider as well. Like maybe our experience here isn't like the norm. I don't think it is. Yeah. Just like, you know, when brothers date white women, they tend to treat them so much better than Tell they treat black it. women. So I would imagine that I'm not getting the real Kenyan dude. I'm getting the Kenyan dude who's like, I know she's not used to this, this, and this. So when I come over, I'm not expecting her to cook. I'm not, ex you know what I mean? It's mm. like, it's a different mm. expectation. Yeah. How does you that know? make you feel though? Like, do you want someone like that? Because I would want someone who would also want to date, like, a Kenyan woman. Like, who doesn't have a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, no, I mean, I've done very limited, I've had very limited experiences with Kenyan men dating. But um, one guy, for sure, like, he, his, as far as class, lower class. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he pretty much only has access to Kenyan women for the most part. Okay. The other guy um, at this point would probably be middle upper, 
And when he dates, he tends to date light. Oh, he's a colorist. Yeah. And he Do you told know you're me probably he, considered here light? That's the funny thing. I'm not as light as the people he's dated oh, before. Oh, okay. So and you're not even the chocolate one. I'm even a little, I'm a little bit more caramel. However, you know, he told me that before he used to only date white women exclusively. That's such a red flag, I'm sorry. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's a red flag, but I think he's trying to grow more towards loving himself. Okay. And he's such the type, you know, people who come for sexual tourism or whatever, like he's such the type, like he's tall and he's dark and he's muscular and he's got swag. And, oh, he's you American? Know I mean? No. He's Kenyan. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting um, because a lot of um, people that are healing from their white with their snow bunny crisis, ah, they often not like, a snow bunny like they often like date light first. That's their e that, that, that's their gateway. You know, it just ease them. So maybe he's on his he's on his journey. He's on his journey. He's on his journey. He's Whatever. on his journey. But I'm not. I'm not trying to like. I don't want to be the first black woman you date. Like I'm so sorry. Like I don't. I don't. I need the ones that were liking black girls from high school. Like not the recovery, not the recovery colorists. I can't. Like I just, I don't need to be the subject of that. Like even I was talking to this guy recently, um, and he kept on like, we, like here and there, like his dating experience would come up, and like it would be like, oh, I dated a Chinese girl, and I'm like, okay, cool, and so like, oh, I dated a white girl, this white girl I was dating in Alabama. I was like, oh, okay, cool, and then he was like, in South Africa, I dated a colored girl, and I'm like. Oh, okay, cool. So when are you going to tell me about, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, when is you going to be like, oh, I dated a Kenyan girl, or I dated a Nigerian girl, or I dated a Zimbabwean girl. But it was all giving very much non-black. Um, which, was, <laughs> which was just something I just mentally noted, you know? It didn't cancel him out of the running, but I just noted it. <laughs> but, I mean, he's cancelled out of the running now. There, I mean, there's reasons, so many, yeah. there's so many red flags. I mean, I've been... I've been, I dated, I remember dating a guy who, first of all, like, I was too dark for his mother and grandmother. Like, they they hated to see me. And he was like, I find you so beautiful, but I don't know why. I'm sorry? You know that's a backhand compliment? Yeah! Of course! <laughs> Of course, of course you know because that. Yeah. he had been socialized that whiteness was a supreme yeah. and then he was drawn to me for whatever reason yeah. and it wasn't computing. I guess there was a cognitive dissonance. Can I speak on that? Yes. Because I've met people in London, in particular, who will like me, but they don't know what to do with the likeness because I don't fit what they've been socialized to like. So I know that they like me and I know that they find me attractive but they just don't want to do anything with it because it's just like that scary for them to have to confront the fact that they like a black woman. I was going to say something else. I was like, let me not be so vulgar on your channel. Be vulgar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the fact that they like someone who looks like me, they're just like, it's just not computing. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it, it's a really difficult place to be for them. So I, I, I mean, I don't empathize, but I sympathize. Yeah. Because like, how could it, it's clearly that bad for you that you cannot date who you like because of the perceptions of others. That's right. It's giving sheep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's giving, giving sheep. sheep. It's giving sheep. What? Oh my God, we could talk about this forever because I think it's important to note that we date based on our notions of privilege and access. So true. Even us. Yes. So as yeah. like as women, so often I hear like. I like a big guy because mm -hmm. I want to feel protected, yeah. you know, or I, I want to date somebody who has a nice car because I want to feel respected and it's my proximity to power, et cetera, et cetera. But my belief is that most of us on the planet are partnered in dating people that we don't even intrinsically like. So it's somebody that society has told us to date. Mm. So, many, so many people are dating the, uh, the wrong gender. Mm, true. Um, Very they're, true. They're not even, you know, true to their intrinsic sexuality. Yeah. Like, and on and on and on. And mm. then, like, proximity to whiteness, you get more respect. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all of that. But and you know then, what? and professionally, mm. when your white colleagues see you with a white person, 
they respect oh, you. Oh, she's more like us. Yeah, we can trust. Them. Yeah, we can trust. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So then you have these people who maybe consciously or unconsciously seek out lighter skin, mm-hmm. white partners, non-black partners. Like it goes on. on. And you can I, can we talk about like the role I think like capitalism has played mm-hmm. in this? Because you know, back in the day, like also just like. Two things. So capitalism in the sense that there's actually a cost of living crisis in these streets. Hmm. Like, it is, it's hard to stay alive. Like, things are expensive all over no, Nairobi's the Nairobi's more expensive than you would imagine. Nairobi's more expensive than Lagos. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, it is. And I don't know whether that's because we have so, there's so much more of, like, an international focus here. Um, and an international, like, people. Um... But like, yeah, like, so I get it. Like when women are like, I need a man with money, like they want to pay, the, they want their mom to live well and their father to live good. They want their younger sisters to and brothers to be sent to school. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it's actually rough in these streets. And then we know that you get more respect and you're treated better in society if you've got money. So like, that is like a capitalist thing. <sighs> Well, I think we've covered everything in this episode. It's been such a joy speaking with you and just knowing you as a human being. Uh Uh-huh, I told you, that's so sweet. Thank you. And and hanging out with you. For sure. I really do hope that you get that condo where you ship, (laughs) you know you shipped over here and I get to see you more often. No, that'll be nice. Please share with the people where they can find you. You can find me on Instagram at EVA Itoje. Todre will put my link in the description box. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Blacks It to Africa. I hope that you are inspired, empowered, and renewed to come on over, even if, even if you feel like Africa would not be your permanent home. At least consider purchasing property here. Think about your legacy and also think about having a vacation home here. We have 54 countries on the continent. Pick one. (laughs) (laughs) See you next time. Bye.